Are you looking for adventure? Do you want to find peace? Long distance trails offer you freedom and discovery. They offer a way to connect to yourself and to the world around you at the same time. The most popular trails have become crowded, but there are so many other trails that have plenty of space. The Trails Around the World podcast is here to introduce you to new trails and to new types of trails and to expand your horizons. Join me as we explore finding out what is possible and how to do it. Christine, also known as German Tourist, welcome back to the Trails Around the World podcast. Thank you for joining us in this episode. We had you with us previously on episodes eight and nine to talk about through hiking in Europe. Can we quickly go over what you call yourself and your background in terms of hiking and adventuring? Thanks for having me again first. Um, as you said, my name is Christine Turmer, um, G- trail name German tourist, and uh, I have hiked uh, right now 54,000 kilometers all over the world. And this makes me probably the most hiked woman worldwide right now. So I have hiked uh, the Triple Crown in the US. I've hiked basically all long distance trails in Australia. And since 2008 and uh, when, when, the Euro, when the Euro lost in uh, lost in value, well, yeah, I've been basically hiking here in Europe more than, I think, 25,000 kilometers in Europe now. I've also cycled 30,000 kilometers and I paddled six and a half thousand kilometers again all over the world. So, yeah, that's very short uh, what I do. And I write books, which unfortunately have not been translated into uh, English yet, but into Korean, Russian and the Czech Czech language. Great. Thank you. What have you been doing recently? I I know you've been out hiking in, in the pandemic and... You weren't able to for a while. I, I know that you're having to deal with logistics. And so what would you be able to share with us about that? Actually, we are recording this in early May. And uh, it's just good luck that I'm actually in Germany right now. <clears throat> and this was not planned. I left Germany uh, mid-March in order to complete another European through hike. From uh, the, the, the entire plan was to hike from Sicily to Finland. So I've hiked the first part last year. We we will touch on that later. And uh, now I wanted to finish the northern half from the German-Polish border up to Finland. So this meant I left the 17th of March uh, in Germany, traversing the entire length of of Poland. But then Corona stopped me because uh, the next country after 1,200 kilometers across Poland was Lithuania and then Latvia, Estonia. But I wasn't able to get across the border. The, um, there was uh, entry restrictions due to COVID, and that meant I would have to go into quarantine for a minimum of uh, one week. And uh, a quarantine of one week for a country which I will traverse in three, in three weeks is a little bit too much, because the next country, Latvia, was the same thing, quarantine, and Estonia, the same thing, quarantine. So I would have been the same time in quarantine as I would be hiking. So I decided to uh, interrupt this hike. I went back to Germany. I'm in quarantine right now as well, but at least here I have my computer, I have uh, internet access, I have a library, so I can actually work and prepare the next trip. So in one week, I will leave again, do a sort of like intermediate trail, and then I'll be hopefully able to continue towards Finland. So that's the plan for six weeks. I've been hiking across Poland in the coldest April for 92 years. Wow. So... (laughs) So yeah, it's usually I'm I'm wild camping all the time, but this time I spend like half of the time in hotel rooms because it was just so freaking cold. It, I, I hiked through snowstorms most of the time, and this in end of April. So so anyway, so I'm I'm happy to be home in, again where I have central heating and uh, <laughs> a warm bed. And next thing I'll go to a much warmer country. Sounds good. Thank you. So in this episode, we are planning to talk about the Sentiero Italia. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that correctly. You do, you do, it's correct. Good, thank you. And, well, I'll let you describe it. Uh, I, I can. I would just be putting back what, what you had said. So why don't you tell us uh, in, in a couple of sentences why we would want to experience this trail and what makes it special? 
Well, to put it in a very short phrase, I, I personally think the Sentiero Italia right now is the sexiest long distance trail in Europe. And what do I mean with uh, sexy? It's because it has everything that attracts a hardcore through hiker. It has spectacular landscape, which was totally unexpected for me. And it has really still the sort of like adventure that the PCT or the CDT had like a couple of years ago. So this is an unknown trail where you can really experience things uh, you can't unless like this really overcrowded trail right now. So it's a combination of breathtaking scenery, fantastic adventures, a great culture <clears throat> and excellent Italian food. So this in short is the Sentiero Italia. So go for it now because, because before it becomes more popular and uh, it will attract crowds. I think I'm actually one of the first people to kind of through hike it. So you'll be really, really making a, a reputation for you if you do if you do it now because it's brand mm -hmm. new. Well, have have Italians done it? Well, let's start maybe about the history about this trail because uh, then you understand why this is a tricky question. Mm -hmm. um, the Sentiero Italia, uh, which runs through the whole length of Italy, we come we talk about it later, was actually created in the in the nineties by the Club Alpino Italiano, CAI. So the idea is, is quite, not quite old, but in the, already dates back from the 90s. So they developed some kind of trail using existing trails, and people actually hiked it. Um, there was some information about it, but already 10 years later, it fell into oblivion. So the trail was not maintained anymore. It never really was completed, especially in, in southern Italy. So basically nobody hiked it. And when I did research on this trail, the only very few trip reports I could find were really devastating. People said like, okay, we tried to hike it, but we ended up road walking basically all the time because there was no trail. So my expectations were really very, very low. I thought, okay, this is a great idea. Uh, they got some money and then basically everything sort of petered out and nothing came out, came out of it. But then apparently, and this was my luck, in 2018, the CAI decided to revive the whole project. So and what I didn't realize, they actually put a lot of money and work into it. The CAI is like a trail organization with lots of volunteer work. And they really, 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 really put effort in it. And they put up a website, they blazed the trail. And uh, actually, I could find one Italian guy who through hiked it in 2019 together with his dog. And uh, I contacted him and I asked, hey, is this like a project on paper or is this a real trail? And he said, he took a long time to answer. He said, well, if you're an experienced hiker, if you have a GPS, uh, if you have a sense of adventure, yes, you can actually through hike it. And this made me think, OK, I can try it. Uh, but my expectations were really very low. So he seems to be the first person who actually through hiked the whole thing. And I was the second person, uh, out, uh, the first person outside Italy who hiked it, not completely because there is various alternates, but I hiked the whole length of Italy. So there's very few people like who hiked it recently, but back in the 90s, I don't know how many people actually hiked it back then. Please describe to us the, the route of the trail. How does okay, that fit into the geography of Italy? Well, actually, this is again a very funny story because when I dis when I was deliberating, should I hike the Sentiero Italia or not, um, I had a totally misconception of the geography of Italy. And I, I'm German, so I, I live close to Italy. So, of course, as a German, I knew there is uh, the Italian Alps where everybody goes for skiing. It's, uh, there is mountainous trail. There is uh, high alpine terrain. But I actually really thought that <clears throat> south of Italy, so, sorry, south of the Alps, Italy is completely flat, which is a complete misconception. Because as I had to realize soon, the Alpine range traverses the top of Italy from east to west. So this is like a horizontal mountain range. Right. But then it's when, when, you, when you look at Italy, it looks like a boot. Okay, but once it traverses east to west, uh, the top of Italy, then there's the Apennine mountain range, which traverses the entire length of Italy all the way down to the toe of the boot. Right. So, and these Apennine mountains are not like uh, easy peasy mountains. This is really also high alpine stuff. This goes up to 3,000 meters 
even like in central and southern Italy. So, and then uh, we have two Italian islands, which is like Sicily, which it traverses as well, east to west. And there is the smaller island of Sardinia, which it traverses too. So, and then to make things even more complicated, because there is so many national parks in Italy, the, the Tierra Italia splits into two, two alternates. So there is one alternate that goes to the toe of the boot and continues to Sicily and Sardinia, and the other one goes to the heel of the boot. So altogether, if you if you add up all these alternates, uh, the whole route is about 7,000 kilometers long with all alternates. But because it's not a finished trail, even the CAI doesn't, the exact length of the trail, they are still developing it. So this is basically, first it goes east to west in the Alpine range, and then uh, uh, north to south, uh, traversing the length of the boot, and then all the islands as well. And and given the north the distance from north to south, that also has a great deal of variety in terms of the types of terrain you're traversing, I would think. Yes, but what was most surprising for me is that it really sort of is similar to the trails like the Pacific Crest Trail or the Continental Divide Trail, because you always, always stay up on the mountain range, which is also like on the CDT, the watershed. So you you have a lot of climbing, <laughs> you have and you have a lot of fantastic breathtaking views because you're always always up there on the crest. It's a ridge trail, in other words. It's 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 really a ridge trail. Of course, you sometimes have to go down into the valleys, uh, uh, and there's lots of mountain passes. But basically, you're always h- high up. Um, and this is this is interesting to know because I ex- uh, my idea was I hiked well into November. And I said, okay, this is southern Italy. It will be hot. It will because this is it is so so far south. But because of the altitude, I was actually freezing. Uh, b- because uh, you, you are very you are you're south, but you are at very high altitude. So this was very surprising to me. So it's not dry, barren land. It's not like southern California. It's really even down south. You have like really old growth forest. Uh, you have a lot of water uh, because of the altitude. Even like in the tip of the boot, there is still ski lifts. We are talking like we are the we are at uh, the height of, of Sicily, which for me is like uh, another name of like uh, lemons and oranges and very hot and barren landscape. But there is still ski lifts because it is so high. Right. This is despite the latitude because of the altitude. It's. I mean, uh, I'm thinking of the fact that there are what uh, there are ski areas in. Uh, Lebanon, I believe, right? Yeah, <laughs> it's, it's, exactly, it's, it's as surprising as that. Yeah, I was. Uh, yeah, that's the idea. So it it follows a ridge, and it it's not when when we th- when we think of trails that follow a ridge, and, and I I gather from what you're saying that this is also what was in your mind. I mean, you're you are a triple crowner. You've done the, the Appalachian Trail, the Continental Divide Trail, the Pacific Crest Trail, and many others, of course. Each of those trails follows a ridge that is fairly straight, maybe less so in the case of the CDT, but still fairly, fairly straight. And this Italian trail is not straight, right? It, 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 it winds around, but it follows a ridge all the way. Well, I would still say it's 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 pretty straight because it's as I said Italy is not is a, is a small con- it's not it's, it's not a, it's a narrow country, right. so uh, so there's not much pl- space to meander around. So, but but yes, it uh, what what it meanders is that it does several alternates to 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 take in all the national parks. So that's where it where it meanders. Right. So Europe has e routes, and this is not. An e route is that correct? Yeah, that's another a really interesting thing about Italy, and it's a really stupid European thing. Okay, we have to go back to the history there. That in Italy there is two mountain clubs, two major mountain clubs: the CAI Club Alpino Italiano, which maintains the Sediere Italia, is one. But this CAI is not a member of the European Ramblers Association uh, who coordinate the European e-trails, the European long-distance trails. So the, oh, the, the, but there's another club in Italy, the FIE, Federazione Italiana Escursionista, or whatever it's called, and they are members of the European Ramblers Club. So 
again, st starting several years ago, they created the E1 trail, which also traverses Italy. But uh, the FAI ha definitely has not as many manpower or money or whatever as the C. AI. So mm. the uh, European Long Distance Trail E1 is more a project on paper than it is really in out in nature. So in several stages, the two trails coincide. Uh, further in the south, uh, they are, go different routes and the E1 is not really completed. It sort of stops somewhere uh, south, of, south of Rome and then that's it. So hmm. I uh, jumped between the two trails in the beginning and I realized uh, if I'm on the E1, it's a, it's a recipe for disaster <laughs> because you end up like in the middle of nowhere with no trail whatsoever, overgrown. So I forgot about it and, and ended up following the Sentiero Italia all the time because this is actually a trail that at least on the paper is completely finished and out in nature is about 95% finished. So this is a more oh. complete trail than the E1. Wow. Okay. And I commented on my Facebook page recently for this uh, for this podcast that the European Ramblers Association (ERA) is the yeah, exactly yeah. yeah. So they, I'm not sure how recent it is, but they are now posting GPX files for the e routes. Yeah, they've always been doing that. But the problem is that uh, only because there is a GPX file doesn't mean there is really a trail. <laughs> So there are pop, uh, there are popular e routes that are actually like uh, motorways for for hikers, like the Alpine Crossing E5, which is very popular for Germans like to cross the Alps. There is popular e, e trails, but in it, but it all depends on the local trail organization. The e uh, the European Runners Association, the ERA has no funding, no money. It's just a volunteer organization based in Prague, and they just coordinate efforts, but they can't put any money into anything. So if there is a strong local mountain club, there is a good e-trail. But if there, uh, if there is no manpower at, at the local area, then there is no trail. So that's sort of like the, the, the hard fate of, of the European Ramblers Association. They really depend on what's, what's happening locally. And then, for example, in Finland, the, the mountain clubs or the hiking clubs said, of, oh, we don't want to be a member of the ERA, ERA anymore. So right now there is no e-trails in Finland because uh, there is no local mountain club. So it's all really complicated. And as long as there's no funding behind the Europe, the e-trails, the e they really depend on the mercy of the local clubs. Huh. Well, that explains a lot about what's happening with the long distance trails in Italy. Um... So if one wants to do one, uh, the really big long one is the one we're talking about. Exactly. So if you look at the map of Italy, like at the, you, you will see the E1 and the Sentiero Italia, SI abbreviated. So uh, don't try the E1. It's just, uh, I don't know whether they will ever finish it. Try the Sentiero Italia because this is where all the money, where all the effort goes. Right. And if one wants to do a really big long alpine ridge hike in europe at this point is there a is there an alternative to this one yes i mean it really depends what you what you want i mean there is even germany tiny tiny germany i think germany is smaller than montana uh, has the same amount of hiking trails as the entire u.s has right in germany the alone germany there is three hundred fifty thousand kilometers of trail wow because basically, if there is a trail in Germany, you can hike it. So there's potential hiking trails everywhere. And Europeans in general are very, very fond of hiking. So there is so much to choose from, so much choice. It's, it's incredible. So if you want, for example, if you want to do an alpine trail, you can do the Via Alpina, which in several variations crosses the Alps. You can do one of the GR trails in the, uh, in, in the Pyrenees. There is really a lot of choice. But... Why I want to present the Sentiero Italia is, I think, as I said, it's the sexiest trail because yeah. this is not like a well-known established route. This trail is full of surprises. The infrastructure is there. There is GPX tracks. There is blazing. Uh, it, it's getting there. But it's still a really, really wild adventure. Whereas the other trails follow established trails. Uh, there is huts. There is ski lifts. There is everything. So this is not as exciting as the Sentiero Italia, which is a fantastic combination of culture 
adventure and landscape. So this is why I recommend this. Great. But I don't recommend the Sedere Italia for a beginner. If this is your first long distance trail, if this is maybe even your first time in, in Europe, I would go for an easier trail. So uh, in on the Sentiero Italia, you sometimes wish you had a machete <laughs> because sometimes it's so overgrown and mm-hmm. nobody knows about the trail. So you have to have this sense of adventure if you want to do it. But if you're that kind of person, wow, this is the trail you want to go for. Great. Tell us more about how this would compare to some of the other trails that are well known like the continental divide trail for instance how was it finding the route italy in many places is fairly dry how was it finding water what was the wildlife like okay so how does it compare to the pct or the cdt first of all as we have said geographically wise it's it's very similar because uh, all all three trails stay up high on a crest and scenery-wise, it can really compare it to the PCT or CDT. I would actually go as far as saying, like, the Santiago Italia is Europe's CDT, so uh, compared to altitude, well, altitude. But it more compares to the CDT as it was, like, 10 years ago. It is, as, a, as, you, as I said, there is a GPX track for all alternates for the entire length of the Santiago Italia. But don't try to hike it without a GPX track, <laughs> because it is surprisingly well marked more than i thought but sometimes i think the guy who did the blazing was the last person who hiked there Mm -hmm. and this might be two years ago so the trail is in places very very overgrown with stinging nettles or i mean this is this is very this this is like um so far south that there's a lot of machia you know this like everything stings everything has thorns and spikes Mm -hmm. so if there is no one with a machete who actually maintains the trail you are scratching your legs and uh yeah it's i remember one one stage like in the very far south because the further south you get the less neglected it is because this compares to the to the this relates to the history or to the, to the uh to to italy where where all the um, uh, the rich areas are in the northern italy northern italy is where the industry is where the wealth is like where people have time and money to go hiking so there are a lot of established hiking trails. Whereas in southern Italy, this is the really poor regions of Italy. So nobody is interested in hiking there, which results in no trails or overgrown trails. Because there are so few people, there is not much, not much maintenance is done. So I remember one stretch in southern Italy, which traverses which, a wind park. So, and uh, I'm following the trail, I'm following my GPX, and uh, it's all very pretty overgrown, blowdowns everywhere. And all of a sudden, I come to this to the slope, and the slope has basically completely eroded away. <laughs> and I could see, like, a, a trailblaze, like, 150 meters away from me on, on the other side of this eroded part, and I could see animal tracks going over it. But just because a, a, a tiny animal with four legs could traverse it, it doesn't mean I could do it. <laughs> so uh, after like bushwhacking and climbing over trees all the time, I realized, okay, there, I, I can't go there, but I have to go up to the ridge because this is where the trail continues. There was no real w- detour around it. I looked at the map and the, de- and the only way around it would mean I would have to do a detour on roads more than 30 kilometers for a eroded stretch of like 200 meters and to make things even worse like it was getting dark so i realized if i can't find a place where to camp i'm i'm in big trouble now so it was so bad that i decided to bushwhack up this steep slope across like machia machia means like there's thorns and everywhere so this is like we are talking like blue uh blackberry bushes (laughs) So, but I had no choice. So I crawled over blowdowns, blackberry bushes, like uh, up to the ridge. And it took me really the next day, it took me two hours with tweezers to get all, <laughs> all the thorns out of my legs and my arms. And I was really bleeding from, from, all these, from all these bushes. But it was no other way around it. So this was really the worst part of the, of the trail where it was a bushwhack from hell. I've, I've hardly had on any other trail. But this is not the rule. 
because especially in the northern half of the Sentieri Taya, where we traverse these rich areas, the trail follows well-established trails, especially in the Alps. There is the Via Alpina. There is uh, lots of mountain trails that are well-established, well-maintained. Then it connects to the Alta Via dei, dei Monti Liguri, which is also a well-maintained trail. And then the Grande Escursione Apenninica, which is like a very spectacular, not very well-known trail, but still extremely well-maintained and marked. So basically up to the height of Rome, there is no problem. South of Rome, this is where the problems start because there is right. no established trail. The CAI had to create it, a specific route for the Sentiero Italia. Right. And they did a great job. They actually placed new trail, brand new trail, brand new trail markings. But sometimes, um, well, you have to push back. Right. So you mentioned water. Water is also a problem because at all trails, when you're high up on the crest, there's a problem. Where do you get water from? So the good news about Italy is even if it is like a deserted landscape, it doesn't mean that there aren't any people. I mean, this is Italy. This is Europe. There have been people everywhere. There's no real wilderness. But of course, like everywhere in Europe, you have this sort of rural exodus. Like you do traverse areas where people have been living like 100 years ago, maybe even 50 years ago. But uh, they could only live on like on farms and like on their livestock. But this is a hard life. So people left these rural areas and moved to the cities. So you come across like abandoned farmhouses all the time. So right now, hardly anyone lives there. Mm -hmm. But sometimes people like farmers living in the valley or ranchers living in the valley bring their cattle up there. So you come across a, a tremendous amount of free-range cattle, everything from cows, sheep, goats. And of course, they need water as well. So, so you're very lucky that there is uh, cattle troughs, not all over the place, but there are cattle troughs. And if there is cattle out there, the farmers like, like bring water to the cattle troughs. So this is, this is basically where you get your, your water from. And because this is cultivated land, there's also like developed springs. Developed means like uh, they, built a, they built a fountain like 200 years ago and it, usually it's still running. But water is really one of the biggest problems of the Sentiero Italia because the water is not always marked on the trail. So if your map says there is a water source, you have a 50% chance that it really is there. It all depends, like, is there a cattle there? How old is it? Is it running or not? So it's always like, like a lottery. <laughs> and it's not dramatic because, like, if bad comes to worse, you have just to descend and there's always some sort of village. Like, you just have to walk, like, for a couple of hours and you come to a village. So you're not in life-threatening situations. But, of course, it can be a nuisance if you rely on a specific water source and it's dry. And then you have to do a big detour to get to water. So it's not life-threatening, but it's, uh, it's the biggest issue on, on this trail. And then also, like, another big issue is sheepdogs. Because, as I said, this is very sparsely populated area up there. So if there's cows, the cows basically free range. Um, so that's not a big problem. But there's also sheep and there's lots of goats. And surprisingly, there's also a lot of wolves. So because it's, 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 the farmer can't afford or the, the, the shepherd can't afford to be there all the time. It's, it, so, so they basically leave their livestock there with a band of dogs, of sheep dogs. Actually, there's a specific brand. What's the name for it? There's a specific, uh, thank you. There's a specific breed, the Maremano sheep dogs, which actually originate in this area. And they are trained and bred to, to guard livestock, guard goats and, and sheep. And I tell you, these dogs are fierce. <laughs> they are white. They have a white fur, a white coat. They are huge. They are not aggressive, but they know exactly what they are doing. So I remember one time I turned around the corner and all of a sudden there is this uh, flock of goat passing exactly the trail at the moment when, I, when, I, when, I, when I'm there. So they were accompanied by six of these Mare Mano sheep dogs. And I tell you, they made it very clear to me that I have to wait till their flock has passed. And then, as I said, I wasn't worried about them. I mean, they are really frightening. They are huge dogs. But as long as you stay away from their flock, 
they, they, are, they don't pose a threat. But if you come across a flock unexpectedly and they, and they see, okay, there's, there's still your potential threat to them, they come running towards you, they are barking, and you have no chance against them. But again, don't be worried. It's, it can be, encounters with them can be frightening, but back, back up, go, go away, uh, wait till the flock has passed, and then, then, then you'll be okay. But the, the funniest episode, and this is, this, is a, this is a longer anecdote. This was, this was really very, very, uh, very interesting. When I, in central Italy, I had a very bad day. It was raining the entire day. It was really raining uh, cats and dogs. And I tried to find accommodation in the last village. But because this was Italian holiday, we are talking here's August. It's the height of the season there. Everything was fully booked. So I had no choice. It was getting dark. So I had to get up the next mountain. And I knew, oh, for God's sake, this is like a traversing a steep slope. I won't be able to find any campsite there. So when I took a look, closer look to at the map, I realized, okay, about uh, eight kilometers away, two hours hiking into the night, there is a refuge. And I said, okay, what the heck? It's, it's, it's dark already. I hike into the night. And so I go up and up and up. Even uh, it, the trail went higher and higher. So the landscape suddenly became really barren. A full moon came out. It was pretty foggy. And uh, it looked like, it didn't look like Italy anymore. It looked like, hey, I'm in the Scottish Highlands here. <laughs> I'm like, uh, you know, this type of cedar, like the hound of the Baskerville. <laughs> so uh, I, I always check with my GPS, where, where is this re refuge? So uh, I realized, okay, here I have to turn off. I, I stand there, uh, check the GPS. It's a full moon and I check my GPS. Okay, the, G uh, the, the refuge is supposed to be only 200 meters away. So I, I stare at the GPS, it's dark, and all of a sudden, I, I'm wearing shorts by, at the time, all of a sudden, something cold and wet touches the back of my knee. <laughs> and I'm like, I turn around, and I see this huge white thing standing directly in front of me. It was this huge dog, really like a type of like the hound of the basketball. And I stare <laughs> at this thing, this thing stares at me, and I scream at the top of my lungs. I'm really scared. I think this is, what is this? And, uh, and I scream so loud that all of a sudden, like a light turns on. And while I'm still screaming, this thing or dog, as it turns out, backs off, like stares at me, a light turns on. And then I realize, oh God, this is just a sheep dog. This is just one of these huge Marimano sheep dogs, which wanted to tell me, hey, I'm here. This is my flock. What are you doing here? And the light that turned on was actually the shepherd who came running out of his uh, sort of like tiny shack. It was no more yes. than a shack. Yeah. Uh, looking at me and basically said, it said, what the heck are you doing here? I mean, we are talking, we are, it's close to midnight by the time. And I'm, one, I'm, I'm six foot tall and Italians generally are much smaller. And he was like this tiny, scraw this scrawny guy looking at this huge German uh, woman, like, and wondering, what is she, what the heck is she doing here? So, and then I realized, okay, this is not a public r refuge. This is the, the, the shepherd's sh shack. Right. Right. And of course, he's being a real gentleman. So he says, uh, okay, you can come and stay in my shack. So I, I take a look inside and this was really, uh, there was wine bottles all over the place. <laughs> he seemed to be a chain smoker. And I said very politely, no, thank you. Uh, I, I really appreciate it, but I rather hike on. So I turned away from him, want to hike on it. And he says, no, 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 loopy, loopy. And Lupi, uh, I, I don't speak Italian, but I know from my Latin lesson, Lupi, that means wolves. Right. And he wanted to he wanted to warn me. This is because this is where, why all the, the, the sheepdogs are there. So yeah. he warned me of, of the wolves. And I, I looked again at him and I looked at the hut and I said, okay, if I was a sheep, I would rather stay in the hut. But, uh, but being a human being, I'd rather be on my own in the tent because compared to, uh, to sheep, uh, the shepherd is probably uh, snoring at night. <laughs> I will have a very, very uncomfortable night at the floor of his, uh, of his shack. So I continued on and just a couple of hundred meters away, I found a flat spot and I camped there. I said, I'm still safe because the sheepdog are pretty close. There won't be any wolves. But this was a pretty, very impressive situation, which said, okay, there, there, there are really wolves. There are really wild animals. There are actually even bears in uh, some areas in Italy. So up on the crest, you encounter a lot of wildlife. 
like as I said, wolves, bears, lots of lots of deer. So it's yeah, it it can compare to the U.S. trails, even wildlife wise. Well, this really indicates that this is truly one of the most wild parts of Europe because I know from my hiking experience that in most of Europe, wolves are starting to come back. I remember something about the last bear, I think it was in Switzerland, having been killed in, you know, 1919 or something, and there's a photo floating around somewhere. But the bears are gone in most of Europe, and and the wolves are are returning, but they're they're pretty unusual, right? Well, actually, I did some research about it uh, after this incident, yeah. and I read that there is several thousand bears. Really? So, sorry, several thousand wolves in in Italy right now, uh-huh. and I think a couple of hundred bears. Wow! So it's not. That that rare. Here I checked. It. It's two thousand wolves and one hundred bears are in uh, still living in uh, Italy. But that's more than, I mean, France, for instance, or or yeah, maybe Spain. Yeah. 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 I mean, but they are only high up in the mountains, so uh, so don't right. expect them to see them in in Rome. But uh, in the mountains where the where the Sierra uh, Italia is, you you'll, you'll find them. Now these these dogs, they're large. That they, are they the ones with long white hair? Exactly, yeah. Mano Sheepdog. Yeah, I've forgotten. It's a similar name in French, uh, but I encountered them hiking in the French Alps. And uh, there they had become fashionable in Paris. And so the Parisians had bought all of these dogs off of the, of the shepherds. And the shepherds had had to turn to breeds that were not purpose bred. And there were problems with attacks on hikers. So there was a an organization, a nonprofit that had been formed that bred and trained these dogs and was giving them back to the shepherds. And so then I was out hiking and the there were set instructions for dealing with these dogs, which is basically do not try to touch the dog and, you know, let the dog sniff you. So what would happen is that I would just be calm, walk on gently don't do anything unpredictable the dog would come circle around you come up behind you and and sniff your heels basically and and then would leave you alone is that is it, is it exactly exactly what happened as well this is this this anecdote i just i just uh told is the same thing the dog was just sniffing yeah. me out it yeah. wasn't aggressive because his flock was safely away behind fences but it was it just wanted to know what's going on here it yeah. happens all the time. It's it's a bit frightening when you're a single hiker like me, and all of a sudden, uh, like five or six huge dogs come running towards you, sniff you out because they come very close, and you realize if they bite you, you have no chance. You have no chance. Yes. <laughs> but, but but luckily they never they never bit me. So so right. but it is right. You have to be prepared, and they are really everywhere. They uh, even huh. each farmer has uh, has dogs. I mean, you need them. They are uh, they are the right. tools. They, they work with dogs. They're working dogs. So if you pass a farm, they all you'll be always accompanied by by a huge, by a big amount of, of barking dogs. You just get used to it. Yeah, the, the most the most remote uh, refuge I stayed in on that on that hike in France had those dogs because they also uh, they they had they were in an old long structure and half of it was a refuge and they they served you cheese that they had made and and local wine <laughs> you all sat on this along this long table and and uh and they did this every night and i had to make reservations with the local mayor i think uh on the phone but and then the the other half of the building was was sheep <laughs> and um and they had the dogs and i remember at sunset that those of us staying there would be sitting at some picnic tables eating out or not eating yet, but um, this is before dinner, but getting ready for the evening and enjoying the, 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 the waning light. And we're, we're high up in the mountains and the dogs posted nearby. And by posted, I mean, went and stood at attention facing in a particular direction. And they were, they went and posted facing in opposite directions and they were guarding against the wolves because we all knew that up that valley there were the wolves, and and so it was it was very well known that there were wolves and and in which direction they came from, i.e., higher up. 
and it it was unforgettable to sort of be in that situation with those dogs posting and and you know that that's the limit of where you would go to you're not going to go past those dogs that night well but i i have to say i didn't want to scare anyone of of hiking there because of the wolves the wolves are uh, if you're not a goat or a sheep or a sheep you don't as a, as a as a human being you don't have to be worried about the wolves because they are not you're not prey for them they are they are shy they are attacking goats and sheep but no no hikers so don't, right. don't worry about that worry more about the, the the dogs but as i said they are no they pose no real threat either if you behave the right way if you behave the right way they're mm-hmm. fine yeah i no, i i i learned to feel very safe with those dogs far far safer than with others um they had herding dogs and then they had those guard dogs the herding dogs i was nervous about um but the herding dogs were not they were they were much more under control of the shepherd whereas the guard dogs were the ones that would be off by themselves but the dog the guard dogs you could actually you, you know you could trust uh if they were the big white ones um, yeah i mean you have to i i really admire these the, these dogs i mean they are out there with their flock all on their own yeah. and they actually they are driving the flock Really? I mean, they are, they, they are guarding them the entire day. They are not like stationary. They are not like in one place. They are actually one uh, walking their their flock around uh, oh. around the mountains to wow. find like the best uh, the best grazing area, and they are out there really for 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 days uh, all alone. There's no I, I don't know how often the sh- the shepherd actually turns up and and g- brings them food, but when I've ne- I've hardly ever seen a shepherd there. They are all alone with their flock and take all the responsibility. So they are very very well trained. Wow, yeah, that's that's even more impressive than I saw in, in France, where the, as I said, the the roles were split among the dogs. So, how did you learn about this trail? Well, I mean, being in Europe and being uh, sort of a professional hiker, I mean, I hike all the time. I write books about it. I, I read all sorts of articles. So, of course, I was aware. I learned about it on the Internet that, that there is a Sentiero Italia. I, I told you there is. there were some very few trip reports, so I knew it is out there. But when I started doing research, I realized that there is two websites that are interesting for do, for do, uh, for doing this trail. There is the the CAI has a specific website about the Sentiero Italia with all the GPX tracks with a, a description of each stage in Italian. Right. So this is where I got all the GPX tracks from. Right. And this is also a recommendation if you want to hike the trail. Always, always check for the newest tracks because this is they're actively uh, uh, maintaining the trail. So when I started hiking it, uh, when I left Germany, this was in May. It was a long, it was a longer hike. I hiked actually from Germany across Switzerland to Italy, all in one go. I spent the entire summer there. So I had downloaded the tracks in May, and then I arrived in southern Italy in like September, October. They had actually changed the route. So my tracks were not accurate anymore. And I ended up like in the middle of nowhere seeing, hey, my track goes this way. My GPX track goes this way. And the trailblazing goes the other way. What the heck is going on here? And then I checked again on their website and I realized that actually uploaded the, the most recent track on their website. So I said, it's a very active trail. They're actually really actively working on that. So this is the first resource uh, I would go to. And then there is another very interesting movement. There is a group of young Italians who say, hey, this is our trail. This is, we really want to promote it. And they founded an organization called Vasentiero, which means go trail, go to the trail, Vasentiero. Oh, and right. uh, they have a brilliant website, uh, where is the CAR website is Italian only. The Vasentiero website is Italian and English. And uh, their goal is to hike the entire trail over various years uh, as a group. And you're invited to join them. And uh, so whenever they hike a, a, a part of the trail, they always dedicate an entire summer to hiking it. They film the whole thing. They put up videos. They actually just published a, a picture book about it. And uh, so they are now building a new website, again, again with GP extracts and a very accurate trail description in English. So when I started the trail, uh, they were just in, a, in the process of doing it. And right now for several sections, it's already up there. So this would be as a, as a, non-native, Itali- as a ne- non-native Italian, I would first go to their website because it's also in English. And Va Senta 
Vasantiero, Vasantiero is, yeah. is uh, VA as Victor, uh, right? Uh, exactly. Yeah. Victor A. Uh, Santiago. Okay. Vasantiero.org, and uh, there you'll find their, their website. They're also very active on social media. And when I prepared for this trail, I contacted both. And uh, the Vasantiero people actually even uh, answered. <laughs> Whereas right. the CAI, as soon as they got a, a message in English, they said, just don't, don't bother. Huh. So the CAI is not very responsive, but the Vasantiero people are. So this is your be- best bet to for, wow. for contact. Okay. That's an interesting study in, in the different types of organizations that are out there, I suppose. I mean, because the, the CAI is actually overseeing the maintenance and updating, right? Exactly. exactly. That's, a, that's a funny thing. But again, I think with the CAI, it's probably mostly older older people. Yep. Uh, they just can't be bothered to speak English, whereas the Vasentiero is, is really mainly young people. This is also right. their, their goal. They say, this is our generation. We are the new generation. We want this as our national trail. So, of course, they are more fluent in English than the older generation is. I think right. this is where the difference comes from. Yeah. You, you see that split in, in the U.S. too, where you have the organization that is trail building and trail maintaining and uh, that sort of thing. And then you have the organizations that are more oriented towards just getting out there and hiking. And as, as you're saying, the, the latter will be more responsive in many cases. <laughs> and and uh, the enthusiasm is more sort of uh, evident or open on the surface. So what was your time frame for undertaking this trail? And what are the time constraints one has to think of in terms of climate versus season and that sort of thing. What what were the months that you were doing this? Well, I uh, entered Italy, uh, as I said, it was part of a longer through hike through Europe when, when I did it. I entered Italy in July. I didn't do the, uh, the Alpine section the, uh, through the Alps. I just did the, uh, the uh, south to north section to the, Ap- to the Apennine Mountains. So, which was about two and a half thousand kilometers. So, I arrived in Italy early in July and I hiked till early November. So, you have, if you want to strike the whole thing, including the Alpine range, you have a tight schedule because we are talking altitudes uh, 3,000 meters and higher. So, of course, it's like with a PCT, you can't go there before basically mid June. And even like in the southern part, I hiked, as I said, till, till early November, which was still doable. No problem. There was no snow. But it was getting much colder, than I, much colder than I expected. And as I said, even in southern Italy, in the very end of like the, the, the tip of the, of the boot, there's ski lifts. So it's not like that you can hike this thing year round. Basically, the hiking season, um, I would say, like in the southern southern Italy, the hiking season should start like um, end of April, maybe early May, depending like what kind of snow year it is. But in the Alps, uh, it's it's like in on the PCT, uh, you can't start before mid June, and the season ends like in September. So you have to time it when you go there because you're always always high up. Your I think your average altitude is one thousand five hundred meters. Wow. So. It is, you can hike into November as I did, but don't, don't risk it because it can be nasty. Right. So you were there in 2019, right? 2020, last year, 2020. Really? In Corona times, in Corona times, yeah. Wow. Okay. And you were far away from other people. So I, I suppose that wasn't uh, an issue mostly. Um, well, actually, um, the Corona thing was actually the reason why I went to Italy. Yeah, so uh, uh, pictures like in um, I had in 2020, I had completely different plans for hiking, and all of a sudden, like Corona hit, right. and I'm stuck in Germany in my home base in Berlin, not able to go anywhere because all the countries closed. Every 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 country went in lockdown. So I'm sitting there in Germany thinking, okay, if bad comes to us, I have to through hike Germany, which I was not very fond of because I've just hiked so much here. Right. So I'm sitting at my desk at my computer and I plan all sorts of, I, I'm sort of tossing around all sorts of ideas because I've hiked so much already in Europe. I really didn't know, I really had to look for some countries where I had not been before. So I came up with this idea, okay, I can hike from Finland where I have not hiked before to Italy where I have not hiked before either. 
And my idea was more to go north because the Scandinavian countries were more open. And Italy, as you might remember, was hit really, really hard during the pandemic. So I didn't expect at all that Italy would open up to tourism. So I started hiking in May across Germany because I said, I can't sit here on my butt any longer. I have to do something. So I, just, I started hiking. And I said, OK, whichever country opens first, I'll go there because I knew I could either extend this hike to Finland or I could, hike extend, I could extend this hike to, to Italy. So as soon as I had embarked on this trail, to my really big, big surprise, the Italians announced we will open Italy for tourism early June. And this was like, I said, okay, this is a decision is made for me. I forgot, I forget all other plans. I'll hike south. So as I said, I continued from Germany via Switzerland. I entered Italy and I hiked to Italy all summer long. And in summer, COVID wasn't really a big problem there. Of course, you had to wear masks in museums or in, in restaurants, but restaurants were open. Hotels were open. You could you could hike there, and I wasn't really very much affected, at least in summer. But the further south I got, like we are talking October and November now, Corona appeared again, and again in northern Italy, entire regions closed down, went into lockdown. But in southern Italy, the uh, the region is called Calabria. Calabria mm -hmm. is very very sparsely populated. So there weren't hardly there were hardly any cases. Right. And I was deliberating back and forth, like, hey, can I really can I really do this? Should I really continue? I was really, really worried about being stuck because flights were canceled. In the end, there were there weren't even flights from Rome to Berlin. I mean, we're talking two European capitals. Usually there are several flights per day, and more and more airlines closed down, flights were canceled. I was like, Oh, will I even be able to get out here? So my uh, sort of like lifeline was there is one train from one night train from Rome to to, to Munich, and uh -huh. it ran even in the first lockdown. This 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 train connection was always always running. So I said, okay, if bad comes to worse, I can always hop on this train and get back. So I won't be stuck. So I decided, okay, I continue. And I remember this very very well. This was really a crucial moment. It was the day after the after the election in the U.S. So this was my last hiking day in, in Italy, as I had planned it. I said, okay, I can't go to Sicily because Sicily was in lockdown again, but I want to continue this hike at the tip of the boot in Italy. So this was my last hiking day. I was descending from the mountainous plateau towards the coast. I could already see the Etna on Sicily. I could see the Sicilian coast. And my plan was, okay, I uh, end in Radio Calabria, which is the coastal town, I lie a, a day on the beach, uh, soak in the, 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 the beach and the good weather, and then I will take the train back to Germany. So I'm walking down this slope, seeing this beautiful view, and I'm constantly checking my phone because this was the day after the election. I wanted to see who has won in the U.S. And while I'm looking at my, at my smartphone, a, note com a notice comes up from the newspaper. OK, Calabria is declared a red zone starting tomorrow. And I, hey, this can't be true. What's that? Uh, a red zone means a total lockdown. You're not allowed to go out of your house only for medical reasons or to go to work. So I really start panicking. I still have like 20 kilometers to get to Reggio Calabria and I wanted to have a rest day there. And so in panic, I called one of my followers. I have, uh, as I said, I've written several books. I have uh, followers all over Europe. Right. And luckily I had one woman living in Italy. She was a German, a German woman living in Italy. So I called her really in panic and I said, hey, what's going on? And she said, oh, don't, don't worry. This is Italy. Don't worry, this is so sudden. They are probably going into lockdown at some point, but you'll be fine. Just continue hiking. Don't panic. This is just an announcement, a plan. And I said, okay, I continue. I remember like I arrive in Reggio Calabria and it is getting it is getting dark. It's it's sunset time. So I look at the watch. I said, okay, I have tomorrow, I have a rest day here. So I, I go to the to my hotel first clean up and do the, you know, the Finnish photos, the famous Finnish, the famous Finnish photo at the beach. I, I can do that tomorrow. Right. And at this very moment, she calls me and she says, OK, I just watched the evening news. This is serious. Calabria goes into lockdown tomorrow. So hurry, you have to get out of here. And I, I'm really hitting the break. I just turn around. I run really, I really literally run to the beach because this is like the last rays of daylight. Right. And I really take, in the very last moment, I take this Finnish photo of me standing at the beach with a lighthouse in the background, take a Finnish photo, 
go to my hotel and the hotel owner is really like excited. She opens the door and says, hey, you know, lockdown tomorrow. What do we do? What do you do? And I'm like, I, I don't know. I, I wanted to stay one more day, but uh, I have to get out of here. So can can you inquire for me? I don't speak Italian. And luckily, this woman, she was uh, she was pretty young. She called the police station for me. They called the train station for me. And luckily, she said, okay, trains are still running tomorrow because this is very short notice, so they don't have any time to, to, to change the, the, the schedules. Trains will be running tomorrow. I called the police. You are a foreigner, and you will be allowed to leave the country. So right. you can stay overnight because I said, okay, if that comes to worse, I have to take the night train to get out of here. She said, no, no, right. you can stay overnight and take the morning train. So I said, okay, that's good. Where can I get something to eat? Where can I wash my clothes? I said, bad luck. Everything is already closed now. And I said, like, but my clothes, I've been hiking for so for such a long time. My clothes stink. What can I do? She said, can, can you wash them for me? She said, no, we don't have a washing machine. And the laundries and the laundromats are all closed. So I really had to wash my clothes in the sink, which wasn't really very successful. Right. And the train trip back home from the southern tip of Italy to Berlin took me 34 hours. Uh -huh. So I was sitting 34 hours in a train uh, with my stinking clothes. I tell you, this was no fun. No. <laughs> but this was, uh, this was like the closest end of a, of a trail I've ever had, really like in the very last minute. I mean, the, uh, I wouldn't have been able to finish this trail one day later. So yeah. very, very close ending. <laughs> so I'm gathering that one would get to trailheads by train. Is that correct? What are the best ways transportation-wise to get to trailheads or to the ends of the trail? Well, yeah, there's several options. I mean, this is Europe. This is not the U.S. There's lots of public transport. <laughs> right. So basically, even to the tiniest mountain village, there's usually a bus or a train. Lots of train lines are actually abandoned. So if you see on the map, if you see there's a train line going, it doesn't mean there's actually trains running. Huh. So you have to check first because it's not it doesn't pay off anymore. But but there are buses. But, but the bus system is very is very efficient. If you want to take the bus, keep in mind that the uh, Italians have a very weird system of selling bus tickets. So it's not like that you can go to the bus drive and buy a ticket. No, you have to go to a tobacco store and buy the bus ticket there. Drivers don't sell them. So it's a bit weird. You have to know the system, but it, it's, it, it works. It, it's just confusing because I, I, was, I was really worried. I, I, I was waiting at the bus stop like the bus driver was there uh, because it was the, 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 the start of the, of, of the route. He was having lunch. I was having lunch and it was boarding time. I boarded the, the, the bus and wanted to buy a ticket. He said, no, you can't buy a ticket. You have to go to the tobacco store. And I'm like, okay, uh, are you leaving now? And, but, but this is Italy. He said, okay, you were just, a, he saw it. He, she's just a gem. She's just a stupid tourist. I, I, I'll wait for her. So I had to, the whole bus, all the passengers had to wait till I run over and buy the bus ticket. And I have had all the time in the world to buy it before. And I just didn't know. Didn't know. Yes. Right. So, so, but again, this is Italy. People are very, are very good natured. So uh, they wait for you, but just have to keep in mind. And yeah. bus rides and train rides are incredibly cheap. So this is not a problem. As soon as you have landed by plane in Italy, getting to a trailhead is, is just a matter of working out schedules, but you'll get her, but you'll, but you'll get there somehow. Right. Uh, can you find them on Google Maps or that sort of thing? The bus, mm. bus schedules? Some, um, it needs a bit of doing research, but, but you'll find it. Right. I mean, I wouldn't start the trail in a tiny mountain village anyway. I would look at, I would look for a ex good access point right. and, and they are, they are, they should be well connected. Right. Some place where it crosses a major mm -hmm. route or a major town. Something exactly. Like that. Exactly. Right. And are there other cultural or um, we've, we've touched on a lot of cultural historical <laughs> factors here. Um, are there others to discuss, uh, uh, towns that are good to pass through or, um, food or things like that? Well, first of all, one of the really attractions of hiking the Santiago Italia is the food. I mean, this is Italy. This is the home of pizza, the home of pasta. It's like, well, you will hardly lose any weight <laughs> when you hike the Santiago Italia. So what's really, really good for, for hikers is two things. First of all, there is in even tiny mountain villages, there usually is a store. 
and in this store they don't they, they don't sell dehydrated food you know these uh, nor side dishes in the US uh, this is very very hard to find but what they always sell is uh, bread uh, panini this is sort of bread rolls and they sell cheese they sell ham prosciutto or whatever and the good thing is because it's, it's in this tiny in these tiny stores you could just go there and say okay i want to buy a sandwich so they not only sell you the bread roll and the and the ham they just prepare it for you so you go there and say oh i want the panini panini with this cheese with this and that and they uh, they slice up the uh, the bread roll and they create whatever sort of sandwich you want and you just pay for how how much the ham and how much the bread cost oh, really? so this is this is great yeah. so I, I all these prosciutto crudo panini with cheese it, 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 it's fantastic yes so if you go even smaller supermarkets do that so and even smaller supermarkets they have this wide choice of cheese sausage whatever so it's really a culinary highlight so and if you go to a bigger supermarket they usually have what's called a tavola calda. Tavola calda is a hot table. So in this hot table, they uh, serve focaccio, which is sort of like a pizza-like bread. Mm -hmm. They often serve lasagne or other hot food that are kept there at this tavola calda. Yep. It's chicken or lasagne or whatever. So that's also great. So you don't have to cook yourself. You eat this wonderful lasagna uh, just in front of the supermarket so that's that's really really great for for resupply and of course wine is cheap sometimes even i treated myself to a tetra pack of uh, half liter red wine <laughs> and and of course in all the supermarkets pasta is available so you don't have and because you come to across supermarkets and stores uh, usually at least like once once every every other day or even sometimes once a day you can buy fresh pasta so you get tortellini all sorts of like with, with uh, you know pasta stuffed with something and and it's even if it is pre-packaged food but it's fresh pasta so you have to you should eat it in one or two days but like the fillings are just incredible. You have like pasta stuffed with, uh, what is it, with prosciutto crudo, with spinach, spinach and ricotta, or with pumpkin, mushrooms, truffles, God knows what. It's, it's really, uh, it's a, the hiking in Italy is a culinary highlight. So this is, this is one of the advantages. Also like you are never ever far away from a historical town. You could even do day trips to, to Rome, to Florence. For example, I had to sit out a, a, a stage of very bad weather in Naples. I spent four days in Naples where it was uh, storms hit the mountains. I was sightseeing in Naples. So even uh, the Sentiero Italia itself does not cross bigger cities, only like smaller places. But like 20 or 30 kilometers away, you find places like Genova, Naples, Spoleto, Gubbio, where you could easily take a, have a rest day, take the bus and have a rest day there. And you should really do that because every all these towns are just have spectacular churches, museums, God knows what. And even the villages where the Centiero Italia passes through are like, Post, picture postcard like uh, it's like these typical old Italian villages. I always wonder what the heck are they doing when they want to have a, a refrigerator delivered because there's no roads in these villages. It's like they are built on hillsides. It's all cobblestone. It's all stairs. A car can't go there. So I always wonder what if they want whatever electronic device delivered. How, how do they do it? How do they get the stuff into their houses? So actually, like drivers, if you drive there, you have to park your car in the parking lot outside the, the village and you have to walk everything because the car can't go. So even these villages, these trail villages are, are, are really spectacular. But there's also a sad part to that, a sad side to that. Uh, maybe you remember that in several years ago, central Italy was hard hit by earthquakes. Right. So, and because this is Italy, this is the downside of this sort of like chaotic organization, a chaotic Italian organization is that even 10 years after the earthquakes, the towns have not been restored. So I ended up hiking. I had an old GPX track and the GPX track brought me to completely destroyed villages. I was actually hiking through D debris, like uh, collapsed houses. I had to climb over these. Uh, I feel you, feel, you feel felt like World War II. Wow. The house had collapsed and, and I had to climb over, over rocks and, and stones. And, and I remember one very touching scene. 
I was making my way across one of these destroyed villages and uh, one house was half intact, only the front side had collapsed. And I could really look inside like in a dollhouse and uh, I could see the, the, former, the former bedroom and the bed was still there, complete with pillows and a bed cover. It looked like a bed cover and it looked like the, the, the person living there had just left for the day. But the earthquake had happened like five years ago. And it was still like so touching to see a, a complete bed with bed covers and, and pillows there. So the Italian government moved these people to container towns. They, they set up containers like in, in rows. And this is where, where, where people are living now, still five, ten years after the earthquake. Right. And this is this is this is this is really moving. I remember even even the churches, of course, the churches had been destroyed as well, and even the churches are now in containers. Then wow. one of in you know, a one of the towns that has been completely wiped out by the earthquake, in the new container settlement, there was a church in a container, and right next to the altar there was a cross, and it said in Italian, "This is the Golgotha of our of our tierra of our of our country." And be below that, there was rocks, small pieces of rocks from all the village churches that had been destroyed. And it said, like, this is village church, this, this is village church, that. And this was so touching. You could see that there was like 20 of, of, of these tiny little uh, pieces of, 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 of bricks or rocks. And you could see all these churches are destroyed now and people are, live now in containers. So that was touching because corruption is widespread in Italy and the government, well, didn't really try to rebuild the cities. Yeah. And even the mountainside, like mountain refuges, I passed mountain refuges uh, built out of rock, of stones, also destroyed and not rebuilt after the earthquake. So the mountain refuge next to it is now like a container again where they serve food to, to hikers. But, they, but the original refuge still destroyed. What sorts of notes would you have about equipment what what would you advise someone to, to take that they might not be thinking of for this well what you definitely need is a gps or a smartphone i would actually recommend a gps okay because because 90 percent of the trail is marked but that doesn't mean that it's always marked and the problem is that the trail mark in italy is usually it's white and red stripes but all trails are marked in red and white stripes. So there's, it's, it's difficult to know, is this the right red and white stripe trail or the wrong one? Right. So, um, and sometimes there aren't any uh, uh, blazes or whatever. So you real this is not a well-established trail. And as I said, the trail is constantly being rerouted, uh, maintained. So this is absolutely essential. And also what's essential, Check constantly, whenever you're in town, whenever you have uh, uh, internet, check whether there has been a reroute, whether you're, the tracks you have downloaded are still the correct ones. So this is the most, uh, the most important thing. Also, take water capacity of around four liters. Okay. Um, just, I mean, there is enough water. The water situation in Italy is much better than on the CDT or on the PCT, but the, the, the water source are so unreliable. So just in case... Carry, you should carry more water than uh, than you think because the next source might be dry, non-existent, or or whatever. So that's the two the two things. Other than that, it's a normal setup, the set, same setup that I would use for for the PCT or the CDT. Right. Yeah, I, I remember carrying seven liters of water myself at the beginning of the PCT, and and that wasn't enough. <laughs> um, so at least it does sound a lot better than that. Are there springs as you go are there are there taps in each village like there are in some other places that you can fill at yes that's so so what are your typical water sources either it's water troughs cattle troughs in the middle of nowhere right that's 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 the most re reliable water source then there is like these really old fountains which are like natural springs that have been fixed like centuries or decades ago by people living there. And they are usually, they're sometimes really very beautiful because uh, there's usually like a statue of St. Mary there or whatever saint. So it's all these springs are usually, as these fountains are decorated and they are very, very old. So if you look at the map and the spring or the fountain has a name, then it's usually very re reliable. If the spring or the fountain does not have a name, hmm, you don't know what happens. And then, and this is a very good news, usually each village has a public water fountain 
which is either like one of these historical ones or like a modern water tap. Mm -hmm. So, and they are not quite obvious usually. If you can't find them, go to the main square, which is usually next to the church. And there, they are usually water taps for, uh, for public use. Right. So, so generally speaking, if there is a village as tiny as it is there, 95% of the time there is a, there is a public water fountain you can fill up. If this is tap water, city water, and you, you can drink it. And also cemeteries, the old European trick, if there's a cemetery, there's usually also water tap to water the flowers. And this right. generally also works in Italy. If you find a cemetery, 90% of the time it'll have a water tap as well. Right. And in terms of shelter, what options would you say are possible? Like, I, it sounds like you're above tree line a lot, so a hammock probably would not be a good choice. No, definitely not. So when we come to like camping, hotel and go, all this stuff, first, let, let, me, let me say first, wild camping, theoretically or legally, is, is not allowed in Italy, like in most European countries. But like in most European countries as well, nobody really cares, especially in Italy, because where the Sentiero Italia takes you through, uh, no one is living. So there's no one... you. Who, who can be bothered. So don't actually, for me, uh, as in the Italia was a paradise for wild camping. Why is that? Because the area you're traversing used to be habitated by people. So there used to be like farmhouses, there used to be meadows, and because they wanted to plant uh, trees or do agriculture, they made these drywall terraces. You'll find all over like in, in, in uh, southern countries. So whenever there's a slope and they wanted to, uh, uh, to have fields or grow something, they had to flatten the terrain and they did this with dry, dry wall terraces. So because people left the area like decades ago, they are abandoned, but the terraces are still there. Right. They are now overgrown, but you easily find, this is, this is like wild campus paradise. You don't even have to look for a flat spot, just look for the terraces and it's, it's brilliant. Right, And it gets even better. What did people grow on these uh, terraces? Very often they, 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 they planted fruit trees there. Right. <laughs> so it's actually you have, you have dessert right next to your tent because there is uh, apple trees, pear trees. There is all abandoned vineyards and which is very, very widespread and it's absolutely fantastic. There is fig trees everywhere. Right. I've been eating one kilo of figs every day because they're just everywhere. <laughs> and you are not stealing them because this is abandoned orchards. So right. it's, it's really there. There is nobody who claims them. If you don't eat them, they, they'll perish. So uh, they are really everywhere. There's also persimmon trees. Uh -huh. Persimmons are grown. There's even now there's, there's cocky trees. So uh, it's it's fantastic. You just have to look on uh, if you find on your map like saying uh, old dwelling or like a f former dwelling. You know, okay, there is no one's living anymore there, but you will find abandoned farmhouses and flat areas on, the, on these terraces. So this is really, really very very easy. And the only problem with free camping is that there is lots of free range cattle. So uh, you'll be woken up by like horses sniffing out your tent or cows passing by or lots of dogs. But again, this is nothing, not a big threat. It's just you have to, you have to like get used to that. There's also lots of wild pigs. Again, no problem, but just don't, don't be surprised if you hear cowbells or wild pigs at night rummaging around the forest. It's nothing that threatens you. It's just the animals that are there. So this is one thing. Um, then the another specialty uh, that I recommend is like Italy is a very Catholic country. And uh, so you come across an endless amount of sanctuaries, hermitages and uh, monasteries and God knows what. So some of them offer accommodation for pilgrims. So, and I suggest like, if you come across one of them, uh, stay there. It's just really fascinating to see like uh, how they live there. How there's still so many pilgrims there, people who go there, they, they don't walk there, they go by car. But during summertime, like the sanctuaries, like there's hourly 
mass services. You can find souvenir shops that sell everything from baby bib to rosaries. It's just fascinating to to uh, to see the, the the life there. So, but also of course you can stay in hotels or holiday apartments or whatever. And I have to say that Italy is surprisingly cheap for European standards. So you can get a very, very nice hotel room for around uh, 30 euros, something like $35. This often includes like having a room in a former medieval mansion or whatever. It's a palazzo because everything is so old in Italy. So they converted these old houses to hotels, Airbnbs or bed and breakfast or whatever. So you can have your cultural dose, even like uh, with, with your accommodation. And hotel owners in Italy are also very, very friendly towards hikers because you're really the exception there. There is no through hiker culture. So, so if, if like a hiker shows up, it's like, hey, what is, what is she doing there? And I even had uh, one hotel owner who told me immediately, he didn't speak, even speak English. We had to communicate with a uh, pantomime. And he told me he had hiked the Camino in, in, in Spain and we hikers have to stick together, he told me. And then I explained that I really wanted to, to wash my clothes. He even took me by his own car to the next town where there was a laundromat and picked up my laundry for me uh, when, it, when it was done. It was, it was fantastic. Or, or another hotel owner, he gave me like uh, leftovers from the breakfast buffet. He said, oh, you must be hungry. Take this cake, take this sandwich, whatever. So people are, are very, very friendly uh, to, towards hikers. Yeah. So to sum it, to summarize it, wild camping le- legally forbidden, but no problem whatsoever in, pra- in practice. Actually, it's, it's, it's this this country or this trail is made for wild camping, but right. you have very good options if you want to stay in town to stay in uh, historical places. Right. And I, as you were, and and of course the Christian sanctuaries as well. And as you were talking earlier about wolves and such and and we're talking about wild camping and i'm thinking in the united states uh, you one camps with bears around and such and and one keeps one's food away from one's tent did you feel that that was something you had to do in italy no no uh no. as i said the wolves and the bears are, are so shy so you don't have to do that what actually happened quite often and this can be a bit scary is that as i said there's lots of free-ranging dogs or people walking their dogs, of course, without a leash. So it happened quite often that I'm somewhere hidden on one of these dry dry wall terraces. And all of a sudden, like, dogs come running towards my tent, circling my tent. Surprisingly enough, they weren't barking. They were just sniffing it out. Their owner sort of far away didn't realize that there was actually someone in the tent. The dogs realized, but of course, they couldn't tell him. So, uh, so this is... This is quite right. often that you'll be surrounded by dogs, but they they don't attack someone in a tent. So, but uh, sometimes I was woken up by, ex, ex, by, by by dogs looking for me. That's that's the only thing that can be a bit scary, or or like as I said, horses show up or cows show up and and want to find out who, who's camping here. Well, for that reason, would you then recommend a tent over, say, a tarp? Oh yes, definitely. I didn't have um, any problems with mosquitoes. But because of the altitude, it can be pretty cold. And because of this, the, the dog situation, I would, I would rather stay in a tent. I think that uh, makes me more confident. And you won't have the dog come in cuddling with you if you're even in a tent. Uh, whereas in a tarp, he could have the idea like, oh, right. maybe I should uh, cuddle with her. Right. How was the language barrier? Uh, you seem to have gotten along very well, but uh, you don't speak Italian, as I gather. So no, how no. did you bridge that? How did you communicate? Well, lucky for me, I speak fluent Spanish and uh, I had to learn Latin at school. So that helped me at least in understanding a bit. But I have to say that Italians, younger people, usually speak English, but not very well. Older people don't speak English, but uh, they don't really bother. They just talk to you (laughs) in Italian, repeat things 500 times if they have to, speak louder and louder all the time, smile at you, they don't get upset, and somehow you'll figure out what they want. And Google Translate or whatever translation Mm -hmm. program you have is your friend. People are used to that. Everybody has a telefonino, which is like a smartphone. 
So, uh, as I said, people are not, uh, Italians are not uh, annoyed by the language barrier. They take all the time to explain things and they'll make you understand what they want. So, of course, there is a language barrier, but because people are so friendly, uh, you'll get around. Great. So what were the costs for the trip? What are, what are the variables that one could consider going into this? Obviously, one has to look at either train or airfare or whatever to get to Italy. And uh, you were saying that the buses and trains to trailheads were very inexpensive. What other expenses are there and how how do they go generally, um, sort of rough amounts? Um, I'd say that uh, through hack of the city of Italia doesn't cost you more or less than uh, through hack of the PCT or, or, or any U.S. trail. The uh, the standard of living or the costs the costs are, are pretty similar. But what you have to take into consideration is that other than on the U.S. trails, you have a lot of possibilities to spend money. So you could live very very frugally. Because uh, hotel costs, as I said, for a hotel room, you can calculate around 30 euros, 35 to 40 US dollars. And this gives you a pretty pretty good place. So, But of course, if you want to stay in a fancy palazzo, you can pay up to 100 or 150 euros. The same goes for food. If you go through Hiker Style and buy food in supermarkets, you will probably pay as much as you would do in the U.S. But if you, like me, decide, okay, I want a panini for, uh, for, for, for lunch, panini is very cheap. You get a, a brilliant, a wonderful sandwich for two euros with uh, prosciutto crudo and, and fresh bread. It's not expensive, but it all adds up. Right. So especially since every mountain pass in Italy, if there's a mountain pass and there's a road through it, then usually on top of the pass, there's a restaurant. Huh. where the, the motor tourists get out, have a look around. There's also lots of cyclists who cycle up. Uh, cycling is very big in Italy. So they right. cycle up, uh, have a break there, and then go go down the, uh, the pass again. So at each mountain pass, you can have a cappuccino, you can have a panini, uh, you could have a torta, whatever, because this is a normal bar. Again, these things are not very expensive. Cappuccino is like one euro, but still it all adds up. Right. So you can have really a luxury life. Um, you can, and each, uh, most villages have a trattoria or a ristorante or whatever. So again, you have to keep in mind that an Italian meal consists of three courses. Getting a, a plate of pasta or a pizza, it can be as cheap as five or six euros, but it's a small portion because they eat two main courses. So they usually have a pasta course as a starter, and then they have a meat course as a, as a second dish, and then they have a dessert. So each course is really cheap, but if you have a full meal, you still end up paying 15 euros, like uh, 18, 18 to 20 dollars for a meal. Right, right. And of course, a half a liter of wine is only two euros, but again, it adds up. But it would be really a, a shame going to Italy and not tasting the food. Right. So I would actually budget a little bit more because this is part of the culture uh, of uh, part of being in Italy. So if you like eating like I do, if you like tasting a wine or a, a cappuccino here and there, then I would budget a little bit more than you budget in the U.S. Right. So you were hiking from July to November, right? Exactly. Yeah. yeah. And if one were going to hike the entire length and didn't have COVID to worry about, um <laughs> So including Sicily, Sardinia, and the Alps, approximately how long do you think it would take? Well, I, as I said, I've hiked the, the, the north, the south-north uh, right. stretch of, of the Sedir um, uh, Italia, which is uh, 2,500 kilometers. Right. So, and because of the constant up and downs, you should not calculate more than 800 kilometers per months okay so usually usually i do 30 the, the typical through hiker 20 miles this is what what my normal uh daily mileage is it but on the sendier italia forget it it won't work because it's the trail can be difficult you have to look for you have to find it it's constant lots of altitude then all these panini and cappuccino in the in the rest of, so i would calculate about 25 to maximum 30 kilometers per day right so 
So if you'd want to do the whole Sentiero Italia, you have to add at least another 2,000 kilometers for the Alpine range. Right. Which means about four and a half thousand kilometers to if, if you hike the whole thing, not including Sicily. Sicily is another month uh, if, you, if you want to through hike that or, or three, three weeks. So okay. if you start early, early in the season, you could do it in, in one season. Again, you, you come to a, like a total length of 4,500 kilometers. Again, this is like CDT, PCT length. Yeah. You know, you need f- five months. You would need at least five months in Italy as well. I would budget a little bit more time because of all, all these distractions. Right. Again, like in the US, uh, if I had a rest day, it's, it's just enough. One day is enough to rest, lie in a hotel room, watch TV, and because there's nothing else to do in a in a normal US trail town. But the right. trail towns in Italy, there's about uh, 500 churches, museums, castles, palazzos to see. So if you want to do sightseeing and having a rest day, you need two days. If you just do sightseeing, you won't be rested. So it, as you see, it's, it's like a catch-22, 22, 21, 20, catch-21. So I would budget more rest days if you want to see something. And again, it would be a shame to go to Italy and not see the cultural stuff. So I would lower the daily, uh, the, the, the monthly mileage in, to have time to, to do the sightseeing. So given the sheer distance and given the altitude that most of the hike is at, which means that the the actual hiking season is fairly constrained. This would be it, this sounds like an enormous challenge to do in one year, and perhaps is better split over two years. Does that make sense? Well, what you could do if you really want to do it in one year, I would uh, I would either like do uh, like a flip flop, right, or start very very early in the season as soon as it is possible in the Alps. Unfortunately, you cannot start before like June and then hike until you finish in uh, in Reggio Calabria. But this would mean you will hike, well, like me, well hike into November. It's doable. As I said, I finished like early November. There was no snow. Uh, I had no night frost yet, but it was, it became uncomfortable. But with the right equipment, you could, I think you could well hike into early December, but then you have to count on snow. Right. So you have six months to 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 hike it, and in six months, four thousand five hundred kilometers ca- are doable if you if you are fast. But I think I actually think if you want to do the whole thing, I would rather do a flip flop to not end in like in, in in the snow. Right. That sounds like a good idea. And just in case people are not familiar with the term flip flop taking a very, very different trail, the Appalachian Trail, for instance, uh, a popular flip-flop is to start at Harper's Ferry, which is at the sort of the Virginia-Maryland border, and go north so that one ends up at the northernmost point in the middle of the summer, then return to Harper's Ferry and go south so that one ends up in the hottest areas in the autumn rather than in the middle of the summer. So it's dividing the hike into two or more, but mostly two sections to match the seasons better. Again, my suggestion is like, I would say like, what, what are you really interested in? For example, the, the most difficult part is of course the Alp, the, the, the range of the Alps, uh, which I skipped because if you hike the Sentiero Italia part in the Alps, the emphasis on really the Alps, you, you don't see that much of Italy. You, right. You'll be like uh, in a high high mountainous area. It's it's beautiful, of course, but this is not the culture trip. So I I skip that. I just hike the north, the south north part of it, like the, the Apennine Range, because this is where you right. really can taste the flavor of Italy. This mm-hmm. is where it's it's a mixture. It's it's still fantastic scenery because it's still alpine scenery, but you're much closer to civilization. Whereas like in the Alps, it's it's more the focus is more on on the mountains. So if you just have a limited amount of time I, and you want to see Italy, then go for the Apennine part and uh, uh, not so much for the, Alp, for the part in the Alps. Right. And also, of course, if you're not an EU citizen, then the uh, length of the visa might or the length of the time you're allowed to stay might become a factor. Exactly. Yeah. So... What is the best way for listeners to find out more about your adventures and, and follow what you're doing? 
Well, I actually even have an English blog where I blog about all my hikes. It's Christine on Big Trip. Just Google Christine on Big Trip and you'll get automatically to uh, the link. And But what would be probably more interesting is I'm on Instagram, Christine underscore Terme. Terme is spelled uh, T-H-U-E-R-M-E-R. And on Instagram, I'm posting in English. I'm also posting daily on Facebook, but in Facebook, I'm posting in German. On Instagram, I'm posting in English. And uh, I post every day. So you're really sort of with me, through hiking with me, because every day, whenever I see something nice, I post a photo, uh, picture in my Insta story. So there you, see, you can always see where I am, what I'm doing, and uh, this is the best way to follow. Great. And I, I will add a nice note that uh, actually Facebook, if one is an English speaker, Facebook translates your posts into English <laughs> automatically. Actually, with uh, with Facebook, it's it's a funny story because I'm uh, you know I, I'm typical German, very efficient, very punctual. So I post every day, every morning six around six a.m. your Central European time for for for, for my readers. So because it's so punctual, like I get so uh, so many notes or so many messages from my readers whenever I finish a, tra a trail, they say, okay. What do I do now at breakfast? What do I do morning? Because the first thing I do every morning, I'm checking out what's Christine doing today. So whenever my post, but sometimes I don't have internet, which is very rare. But if I don't have internet and my post is not up at 8 a.m., I get the first message messages. What has happened? I are, are you lost? Like wh 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 why did why haven't you posted? So it, it it's sort of addictive because it's every every day very punctual, 6 a.m. in the morning as a post. What is Christine doing? So uh, it's, a, it's a fun way of, of following me. I have a lot of interaction with my followers and I, I always try to answer every, every comment. So, yeah. So as you said, I have some followers in the US as well because Google Translate seems to work pretty well. Yeah. Well, that's terrific. And thank you very much for joining us again. I hope we can do it again in the future with more trails. And I really appreciate all of your experience and expertise coming in to educate us about uh, about this exciting new trail. Thank you for having me again and happy trails to everyone. Thank you very much. Thank you for listening to the Trails Around the World podcast. Please visit us online at trailsaroundtheworld.com and please join our Facebook group under the same name. If you liked this podcast, please help us out by leaving a review on your favorite podcast source, such as Apple Podcasts. This is Sky King, and I look forward to you joining us next time. In the meantime, happy trails to you, and please remember to leave no trace as you enjoy the outdoors.